Thank you for tuning in to RTM Nation Online, where we believe that you will receive the abundance of peace, prosperity, security, stability, health, healing, and truth. If you would like to learn more about the ministry, click the link below. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Now let's get into the message. Heavenly Father, we just give you praise. We give you honor. We thank you, Lord God, for your word. We thank you, Father God, for Holy Spirit who is present on the inside of us. We thank you, Lord God, that he will bring us clarity, understanding, and enlightenment of your word. We thank you, Lord God, for what we will gain and what we will prosper as a result of hearing your word this evening. And we just give you all the praise and the honor in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Well, why don't you hug a couple of people and you may be seated. And as you take your seats, if you would turn in your Bibles to the book of John chapter 16, John chapter 16 and verse 33, and we're going to read this out of the Amplified. You know, God is such a good, good God. And when we think about, oh gosh, his goodness and his mercy, and we think about the grace of God, uh, that should be a great encouragement for us. That should be something that just kind of gives us a shot in the arm and say, you know what? I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm going to live out my life the way God has planned for it to be lived. And um, God has put so many things in place for us and has so, such a great expectation concerning us. We have expectations concerning God, but he has wonderful expectations concerning us. You know, God, think of us. Um, when we get born again, he knows there's nothing impossible for him, but he believes there's nothing impossible for you to do either. Anything that he has directed you to do, he believes it's, it's not impossible. That's why he, you know, tells us things, and it may be blowing our mind, but God's not moved by it at all. When I think about uh, the accounts in the Bible, especially the account of Noah, and I think about the fact that God shows up to Noah and says, I want you to build me an ark. Now, it's not like he'd ever seen an ark before. And then he began to give him all the details concerning the ark. And I bet you God didn't stutter not one time while he was giving out the instructions. You know, I wanted to be this time. You know, I, I don't even know how he measured it out. But God was telling him, you know, I wanted to be this big, this tall, this big. You put this many rooms on it, in it. And he was particular even about the wood he built it out of. He was like, you know, you got to get this particular kind of wood. And, and I'm sure Noah was... Not Noah, but I'm sure Noah, I'm sure he was thinking, what? But God didn't pause, he didn't stutter, he just gave him everything he was supposed to do. Now, when I think about that, now it's not like they had the same kind of uh, mechanical devices we have to pull all that stuff together. Now, you're talking about some long wood, I'm thinking, I mean, I had seen the ark, but I've, I've looked at the measurements, and I'm thinking to myself, I wonder what Noah was thinking. Like, what? And it's going to rain? Rain? What? It's going to rain? <laughs> what? It's going to rain, and the earth is going to flood? What? what is, you know, I'm sure his mind, I mean, he's listening to God, and apparently he came to God because he hears from God. But nonetheless, have you ever heard God telling you to do stuff, and in your mind you're going, What? Like, is there somebody behind me? Who, me? I'm supposed to do that? And God does not even hesitate because his expectation from us is that we can do anything he's asking us to do. He's like, well, I'm confident. You got this. You got this. So, you know, all through the Bible, we can see God doing that. And he still does the same things because he's looking not at your ability. He's looking at his own ability to get it done through you. So, He's saying, be, that's why he's like, be confident in, in me. Be confident in Jesus, because I wouldn't tell you to do something I didn't think you were capable of doing. Amen. How about that? Now, we have to understand that there is an enemy that, that want to keep us from doing those things. So we're going to um, 
I'm going to start, well, we're going to read verse 33 again in the Amplified because um, I didn't know what the title of this. It's just that God don't want us to faint. He don't want us to give up. He don't want us to cave in. He doesn't want us to think that anything that he's asked us to do or anything that we face is something that we don't have the ability to overcome, to conquer, to be victorious in and delight in it and not be stressed in the process, but that we will rest through the whole thing. Look <laughs> at somebody say rest. <laughs> And that take that 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 take you know that that takes something to rest through a process of something that God has given us to do. So it says in um, verse thirty three, this is what Jesus said: "I have told you these things so that in me you may have perfect peace and confidence. In the world you have tribulations and trials and distress and frustration." But be of good cheer, take courage, be confident, certain, undaunted, for I have overcome the world. I have deprived it of power to harm you, and I have conquered it for you. So Jesus is telling them some things, and he says, I'm only telling you this stuff so that you can be at perfect peace. So he tells us, okay, listen, you're going to have some challenges. You're going to have some, some testing, some stuff going to go on. He said, it's going to be okay. But, un but unfortunately, sometimes in the body of Christ, as soon as the test comes, we like want to fall apart. It's like, why is this happening to me? Because Jesus said that's what was going to happen. So it's, it's nothing that's supposed to be new to us. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And I'm not saying that as if, you know, I'm the expert on it. I mean, there's some things happen sometimes. And I'm thinking, what? <laughs> we were going pretty, we were going on pretty good, weren't we, Jesus and Holy Spirit, weren't we? I mean, we was all happy and stuff, weren't we? We was all, I mean, have you all, y'all sitting there looking at me, haven't you had those moments where God told you to do something and you do it and it's like everything is just clicking and it's just so great and it's fantastic and we just love Jesus and Jesus loves us and then all of a sudden something happened, you're like, wait a minute, whoa. Well, I, 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 what, what is this all about? What is this all about? But let's look at... Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, looking in the Amplified, it says, For our light momentary afflictions. Don't you just love how Paul just act like it ain't nothing? He said, For our light momentary afflictions, and he calls them momentary. He said, This slight distress of the passing hour is ever more and more abundantly preparing and producing and achieving for us an everlasting weight of glory beyond all measure excessively surpassing all comparison and all calculation, a vast and transcendent glory, blessedness never to cease. Since we consider and look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen, for the things that are visible are temporal, brief and fleeting, but the things that are invisible are deathless and everlasting. So he says, okay, we need to look at this as momentary. Now, obviously, some people's moments seem to last a little longer than other people's moments. But nonetheless, he said, it is going to pass away. But sometimes we set up camp as if it's going to be here for eternity. But he says, this, he said, he said you gotta, you gotta look, we got to look at it the right way. He said, this, this momentary thing that's happening to us, he said, it's gonna, he said you need to look to the end of it. It's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to produce something greater than what you ever thought or imagined. He said, you got you to gotta look at that. You got you to gotta go along with what I'm saying. Understand that I'm telling you to do a good thing just because you've got some opposition does not mean it's not going to work out for your, for your benefit or for your glory or, or come to pass as I have said. Let's look at Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 18. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 18. I just want us to be encouraged. Be encouraged. Be encouraged. Ephesians chapter uh, 3, starting at verse 8. Ephesians 3 and verse 8. It says, this is what Paul says. He said, to me, though I am the very least of all the saints, God's consecrated people, this grace, favor, privilege, was granted and graciously entrusted to proclaim to the Gentiles the unending, listen at this, the unending, boundless, phantomless, incalculable, and exhaustless 
riches of Christ, wealth which no human being could have searched out. He said, it is unsearchable. He said, this, this grace, this, this, God told me to share the, the grace with people. He said, and help them to understand or proclaim to the Gentiles how unsurpassing, how, well, how unsearchable the riches of his glory is. He said, it's, 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 it's beyond what you could ever think or imagine. Sounds like Ephesians 3.20. He says, and so he, the whole idea is keep your eyes on the prize. Don't be moved by uh, uh, things that come to distract you. In verse 9, he says, listen at this, also to enlighten all men and make plain to them what is the plan regarding the Gentiles and providing for the salvation of all men, of the mystery kept hidden through the ages and concealed unto now in the mind of God who created all things by Christ Jesus. He said, and why did I do this? He said, the purpose is that through the church, that's us. He said, through the church, the, the complicated, many-sided wisdom of God in all its infinite variety and innumerable aspects might now be made known to the angelic rulers and authorities, principalities and powers in the heavenly places or heavenly spheres. This is in accordance with the terms of the eternal and timeless purpose which he has realized and carried into effect in the person of Christ Jesus our Lord. He said, I needed to prove a point. And I'm proving it with the church. How wise I am. He said, I am going to show principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this age. He said, I am going to show how wise I am through the church. That's us. He said, I'm going to use you to let everybody know I am it. That I am God. There's no one who's wiser than me, no one who can put together a plan like I, no matter what you do, God says, I'm wiser than you. And he said, and I'm going to prove that through the church. So we're the proof. Glory to God. He says again, let me read it, verse 11. He said, this is in accordance with the terms of the eternal and timeless purpose which he has realized and carried into effect in the person of Christ Jesus our Lord. He said, I'm going to do it through Jesus. He said, in whom, because of our faith in him, we dare to have the boldness, courage, and confidence of free access and unreserved approach to God with freedom and without fear. I, God is something else. He said, I, I, he said I'm not even... I, I, I'm going to do it, but I'm going to do it through man. I'm going to do it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show how wise I really am. And he says, and, and give, and then we should, since he's using us, he said, listen, you should have boldness to come before me because I'm using you. I'm asking you to do something since I'm the one who's responsible for making sure it happened. Just come to me. Boldly come up and get what you need to carry out my plan so that I can show principalities how smart I am. You know, Satan looked for a long time trying to find Jesus, killing up so many people. Let me tell you something. When I found this out, I was just so um, blown away because it's not how you would think unless you was reading the Bible. See, you know, Jacob, remember Jacob, he... Um, he was sent away by his mom, and he worked seven years for Rachel. Seven years for Rachel. That was the one he wanted. Then he kind of got fooled into marrying Leah. And, you know, the word of God says she wasn't quite as attractive as Rachel. And so, but Rachel couldn't seem to have a baby, but Leah was just popping them out all over the place. But, you know, he still, he still was just, he just love Rachel, just love Rachel, just love Rachel. And so, of course, you would think it would, that would be the couple that, um, you know, was it, the star of the, of the whole show. But do you all know that Jesus Christ came through Leah? Not Rachel. The one that was discounted. The one that 
I don't really love you. The one that, seemed, that was rejected, the one that wasn't, you know, all that. Everybody wasn't flocking to her daughter, marry her, to the point that the father tricked Jacob into marrying her. But she was the one who actually who bore the lineage to Jesus Christ. See, we would have thought, oh, it's Jacob and Rachel. But actually, it was Jacob and the one that nobody wanted. Now, who would have thunk? <laughs> you all understand, that's what I'm saying about God's wisdom. It just far outreaches what we think ought to happen. So he says, you know, when I'm telling you to do something, it doesn't matter what other people think about you, what they say about you, how other people look at you, no matter about your education, it doesn't matter about what family you came out of, it don't matter who your parents are. He said, because I'm going to use you to show how wise I am. He said, I'll use the foolish things. Ah, oh, God is such a good God. Let's look at uh, Ephesians. Did we just look at that one? Oh, yeah, we were right there. He said in verse 12 again, in whom because of our faith in him, faith in Jesus Christ, he said we dare to have the boldness, courage, confidence of free access and unreserved approach to God with freedom and without fear because God said I, opened, he said, I did everything I did so that you can come to me without fear, without any shame, without any guilt, without any doubt that I'll help you. I did everything so that you could have free access. And you know that's all talking about the grace of God and how Jesus, how Jesus came so that we could uh, receive righteousness through him. He said, you, 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 you need to be bold about coming to me because I'm trying to prove a point through you and don't let anybody think that you're not qualified. And especially you. You need to stop disqualifying yourself. I don't know enough scripture. I haven't been in church long enough. Stuff don't seem like it's working out for me. I don't really know what's happening. You know, interestingly enough, something in your life may not be quite worked out, but there could be other things in your life that's clicking on 100. As God gets you through this part that don't seem like it looks that well. But we sometimes will take a part that doesn't look like God is taken care of, and we make that the focal point. And God's like, don't make that the focal point. I'm working on that too. But why don't you step into the good stuff and rejoice and be excited over what is happening to you that's good. Yes. Glory to God. Yes. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. It's all about how we see things. It's all about how we look at things. Because God's certainly not looking at them the way we look at them sometimes. And that's why it's important. And I always say that. It's important. If you're feeling fearful, afraid, doubtful, you are looking at the wrong thing. You're not seeing it through God's eyes because that's not how he sees us. Amen. Hebrews chapter 12, starting at verse 1, it says, um, we're reading out the Amplified, it says, therefore, then, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses who have borne testimony to the truth, let us strip off and throw aside every encumbrance, unnecessary weight, and that sin which so readily, deftly, and cleverly clings to and entangles us, and let us run with patience in patient endurance and steady and active persistent the appointed course of the race that is set before us. In the uh, chapter before, you know, we look at that as the faith chapter, but he talks about those who uh, acted in faith and that they, they could not actually secure everything because they were waiting on us. That everything's not complete without us. So those are the witnesses that he's talking about here. And then verse 2, he says, looking away from all that will distract to Jesus. Looking away from everything that will distract, he said, you need to look at Jesus. He says, who is the leader and the source of our faith? Giving the first incentive for our belief and is also its finisher, bringing it to maturity and perfection. He for the joy of obtaining the prize 
that was set before him, guess who the prize was? Y'all not going to talk back to me? <laughs> you don't know who the prize? What was the prize? Y'all ain't sure about that? What do y'all think the prize was? <laughs> what was the prize? Uh, All right. <laughs> okay, just want to make sure. That was set before him, endured the cross, despising, ignoring the shame, and is now seated at the right hand of the throne of God. He says, just think of him who endured from sinners such grievous opposition and bitter hostility against himself. Reckon up and, cons and consider it all in comparison with your trials so that you may not grow weary and exhausted losing heart and relaxing and fainting in your minds. Look at what he says happened. Fainting in your minds. He said, you need to look at what Jesus did. Consider what he did. Look at, look at the cost he paid. Look at, look at all that he, he went through just to obtain the prize of us. He said, so when you're fainting in your mind and feeling like I can't go on, he said, look at what Jesus did. Not that, we, not that he wanted us to suffer like he did because we're not little mini Jesuses. He's not talking about that. But he's saying, look at the price that was paid. Look at what he took on. Look at what he decided to do. Look at, look, and he, he did it. He did it because of us. He did it so that we could gain victory. He, he did all that he did. He said the shame, the, the, the things that people said concerning him. I mean, you know, the Pharisees didn't ease up off of him at all. You know, they said that, you know, he was a worshiper of the devil. I mean, he, they, I mean, they went in every opportunity they got. No matter what he did, they found something, something wrong with it. Oh, you healed that person? But you healed him on the Sabbath day. You so wrong. <laughs> he couldn't even do good, and they liked it. It just was bad. We need to just shut him up. I mean... It's one thing to get ridiculed because you did something wrong. It's another thing. How many, how many of you, I know it's happened to people, you did something good, you thought it was good, but then people talked about it anyway. It's like, what? I mean, I can't, I can't catch a break. If I do wrong, you're just a bad Christian. If I do right, I did the right thing wrong. That's, that's the way it was with Jesus. He said, I, he said, I went through it all. It didn't even matter. He said, because of you, I did it all so that you can obtain the victory. So make sure you keep your eyes on the right thing. Keep your eyes focused. Don't allow yourself to, don't allow your, your eyes to wander off the prize. Don't allow Satan to distract you in any way, as Paul said, with these light afflictions that are momentary. But we have to have that patient endurance. Yeah. Praise God. We're going to get to that. You're going to like it. How many of you know there's a difference between intellectual knowledge and experiential knowledge? There's a difference between having intellect and having an experience. Because once you have an experience, you don't care what somebody's knowledge say because I don't care what you say. I know what happened to me. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 3, verse 19. Looking at it in the Amplified. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 19. And it says, that you may really come to know practically through experience for yourselves the love of Christ which far surpasses mere knowledge without experience. He said, I don't want you having just knowledge. He said, you need to experience my love. He goes on to say, uh, the love of Christ, which far surpasses mere knowledge without experience, that you may be filled through all your being unto all the fullness of God may have the richest measure of the divine presence and become a body wholly filled and flooded with God himself. He said, you need to experience that. He said, you need to experience that kind of love. You need to. And that's why Paul said in the verses before that, he says, you know, my prayer is 
that you un come to understand or you experience the death, the height, and the breadth of this love that God has for you. He said, because you need to have an experience. You don't need to just have knowledge, but you need to have an experience with love. And you know, that's what's wrong sometimes in the body of Christ. They really have not acknowledged or recognized the love of God. They have not experienced it. They just have knowledge of it. But it's something totally different when you've experienced the love of God and you've seen him working and operating on your behalf. And you, and you just you just you look and you say, I know God loves me. I know God loves me. And we need to be praying for people who just got knowledge because there's a lot of people that sit in church have never experienced God. They just have information. They got notebook after notebook. They got Bible after Bible. You know, after a while, you go through the Bible, you've marked it all up, and then, you know, you go back. Some people take their Bible, they use a written Bible now, and they copy all their notes back over into their new Bible, and they still have not experienced God. I was asked one time by um, one of our um, uh, pastors that was pastoring our teens, it was like, so... Pastor Deborah, what do you think the, the, the challenge is? What do you think the problem is with some of our teens? I said, they've not had an experience. Because he asked me that because he said, because, you know, I'm working with teens that grew up in the church. They were, you know, they, they've been here since they were little and, and they know the word. I said, yeah, they do. But they have not had an experience with the word. They just know what the word says because you can start just, you can start a verse and they can finish it and they, they were good at giving the right answers. <clears throat> but they've not had an experience. And so you meet people like that all the time in church and you think they're okay because they can quote scriptures. That just takes a good mind and memory. But an experience, you can hear an experience. You can, when someone is, you can, you know, when you, you can hear an experience, glory to God. And God says, you know, I don't, I don't want you to, to be just intellectual. He said, you need to have an experience to go along with that knowledge that you're having. And some, of, some people need to just start praying, God, I need to have an experience with you. I need to go further than just knowledge. Amen. I want to experience these things that you're talking about. I want to experience peace that surpasses all understanding. I can remember when I first read that scripture. Greg was very much unsaved. And it was, it was, you know, it wasn't peaceful in our home at all. And then I read peace that passes all understanding. I was like, I need some of that. I need some peace that surpasses all understanding. Because I don't understand nothing that's happening to me. You know, I went down my line of, you know, God, I, I believe I did the right thing. See, this before I knew about grace of God, I had to, you know, justify myself. God, you know, I, 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 I don't party. I don't drink. I went down all my I don't list. I don't do drugs. I mean, I'm a pretty good girl. I went to church all my life. I mean, I even try to get to church. I'm in college. I don't have a car. I mean, listen, I was going to Catholic services. I didn't know what they were doing. But... <laughs> You know, I had to, I had to get, you know, I had to get my list done. On Sunday, you go to church, right? If you good, you go to church. In my book, that's what it is. If you good, you go, and you read your Bible. I, I'm, 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 I'm like, okay, let me just read this scripture. Okay, I did, I, I, I did my, I did my, my duty. So I'm in all kinds of churches just because. So I'm like, God, I, I went to church and, and you know, I prayed about marrying him. Although, in retrospect, he didn't say do it. But anyways, I, I prayed. You understand what I'm saying? Y'all know what I'm talking about. Okay, so I, I, I prayed. God, should I marry him? You know, y'all want to know the truth. Actually, I dreamed the world came to an end. I really did. <laughs> but I married him anyway. <laughs> and it almost did end, right? <laughs> So when people say, I pray that God's not talking to me, I'm like, no, nah, you just not listening. <laughs> you go do it your own way. And God's like, I'm so gracious. Go right ahead. <laughs> but I went down. I was like, God, you know, I went to school. I didn't cut classes. Even when they were, because I was in school when integration first started, I was in high school. And so it was, I was in Atlanta. It was a lot of people not going to school because 
people just couldn't get together. It was like a fight, and they'd have to break it up, let everybody all out of school. So, you know, all that stuff was going on. I'm like, you know, God, I, 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 didn't, I didn't protest when they wanted to. I, I just went on into my class. I did. I mean, I went. I go way back, you know, God. I, I went to church when I was a little girl. I just, I did everything that I was supposed to do, and I came to college, and I did my work. God, I'm educated. Why am I in this chat? Why is this going on? I am not stupid. Like that, any of that had anything to do with anything. But I went down all my accolades of why you ought to be helping me, <laughs> helping me do what I do. And then I ended up where I ended because of the choices that I made. And so then it was like, God, I need this peace that surpasses all understanding because I, I can't, in my mind, I can't wrap my brain around why I don't have the perfect marriage because after all, I did it the perfect way. <laughs> I did it the right way, God. But, um, and I can't even tell you when it came. I just kept asking God about it. And then I just know that after a time, it just didn't really matter to me what Greg did. It just didn't, it just didn't move me anymore. Not that I didn't love him. It's just that that was, I was building my relationship with God. I was like, God, I need to know who you are. I need to know I need to really know you, not just be a person that attends church. And I, I, just started, I just started doing things. It was like, okay, I'm a part of the, a social club that I started. I'm like, I resign. I'm not going to be a part of that anymore because I am seeking God now. I really, really, really want to know him for real, for real, and not just uh, go to church and have information concerning him. So God... It's, it, he says that we need to have an experience with him. Amen? Yeah. Let's look at 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1. And we're going to... Um, we're going to start at verse 3. But I'm going to start this off in the Message Bible. Verse 3 in the Message Bible. And it says, what a God we have and how fortunate we are to have him, this father of our master, Jesus. Because Jesus was raised from the dead, we've been given a brand new life and have everything to live for. Amen. Have everything to live for. Let's look at verse 6. It says, I know how great this makes you feel, and it does. Even though you have to put up with every kind of aggravation in the meantime. Verse 7 says, pure gold put in the fire comes out of it proved pure, genuine. Faith put through this suffering comes out proved, proved genuine. When Jesus wraps this all up, it's your faith, not your gold, that God will have on display as evidence of his victory. Now I want to go back to um, verse 7. And we're going to look at that in the King James. It says that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perish, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. So he speaks here, again, concerning trials and tests that we may have. Uh, let's go, go back up to verse 6, because I want to, we need to read that. It says, Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, and we hate that. I remember when I first read that, I was like, need? Need? Who needs to go to a test of trial? What do you mean, Peter, need? He says, wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness, though uh, through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than gold, that perish, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory. So again, he's talking about some testing or some trials that we may face. Um, and understanding that he's talking about a faith, a reliance on Jesus Christ and what he's done. And I believe I talked about the fact that it's not faith in Jesus, but faith on Jesus. Because 
again, the example is if I put my Bible on this podium, there's nothing this Bible is doing to hold itself up because it's lying on the podium. It's the same way as Jesus is saying, I need for you to rely on me, trust in me. Stop trying to hold yourself up. Stop trying to do it yourself. Allow what I've done to support you, to carry you. And again, like I said, Satan is always trying to get us to uh, support ourselves, to be our own strength, to be our own power, to, to walk in our own ability. Uh, he's trying to get us to look inward. I got to help myself. I got to support myself. I got to take care of myself. I, 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 I got to do this. And, and, and we're not actually leaning on Jesus or allowing Jesus uh, to support us, a God to support us. As a matter of fact, I read to you about we need to look away from those things. We need to look away from the, the, the Bible says sins and weights. So a lot of times it's not so much a sin as it is a weight that we need to look away from. And understanding that um, in keeping our focus, in keeping Jesus in our view, keeping in what he did, keep, keeping our focus on him, uh, gazing upon him, in other words, intentionally looking at him. When something challenges you, the first thing you do is go to Jesus. First thing you go is realize what Jesus has done. Realize that he has already paid the penalty and the price for sin. Understanding that the only reason uh, you're being tested or you're being tried or difficulties or challenges are coming uh, into your life is because of what sin, ha what happened with sin. And because Jesus has already taken care of the sin factor, understand that we're not in debt anymore. You know, we've been, I've been kind of throwing things out by, you know, telling you things like, you know, when things are happening to you, you need to just say paid for. I'm saying that because it actually has been paid for because the challenges, the trials, the tests, they come to try to make you it's there because of sin. It's there only because sin entered into the world. That's the only reason it's there. And the enemy is saying that you're guilty and you deserve this to happen to you. That you're all sinners. And whatever is going on in your life has to do with what you cause to take place. That's why you find sometimes yourself going through what I've done. And you even have, un unfortunately, people telling you what you've done. That's why, that's why you're in the, that's why you where you are. I recall, I, uh, I think it, it was Miss Phyllis. Unless she's sitting in the corner over there. Hey, Miss Phyllis. I can remember someone broke in her house, and someone had nerve enough to say that she must not have posted her angels, and that's why somebody broke in her house. Wow. Oh, you know we was all over there doing all that craziness. Just, I mean, guilt on top of guilt, and, and, and you just weren't doing enough, and you weren't praying enough, and you weren't fasting enough. No, it's because of what the enemy was trying to do to us. He was saying to us, no, you're still guilty. You're still, you still not cutting the mustard. You're still not, you're not where, but then Jesus has already, he cut the mustard or whatever else you want to talk about. He's already done all of that. You all understand what I'm saying? And we're not guilty. I've already been justified. I have right standing with God. My sins have already been forgiven me, past, present, and future. So this thing that's coming to me is not mine. I don't need to possess it. That's why we keep looking at Jesus intently. Step. As a matter of fact, gaze means to study. We need to study Jesus. Yes. Glory to God. Amen. We need to look at him. We need to admire him. We need to embody and realize and adopt the, the, the relationship that we have. We need to adopt the aspects of the relationship that God desires to have with us. We need to look at those things and we need to understand that this relationship that he, that he wants us to, to grasp and understand is a relationship of graciousness. A favor, yes. loving kindness, yes. peace, yes. joy. He said, this is what I want to give you out of the relationship. Yes. 
It's all about what God wants to give and get to us. Yes. Glory to God. Amen. Let's look at James, James chapter 1. James chapter 1, verse 2, and we're familiar with this. <laughs> James chapter 1 and verse 2. He says, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. He says, but let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Counted all joy, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Do you know that part of the fruit of the Spirit is um, patience? It's faith. Did you know that? So when we say we don't have patience, that is not true. You have patience. We have faith because when the Holy Spirit moved on the inside of us, he brought all those things with him. Let's, let's go there for a moment. Let's go to Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. Because I, I want to show you something that, man, I got so excited about it. Galatians chapter 5. Verse 22. He says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. The Amplified says, but the fruit of the, fruit of the Holy Spirit, the work which his presence within accomplishes, is love, joy, gladness, peace, Patience and even temper, forbearance, kindness, goodness, benevolence, faithfulness, gentleness, meekness, humility, self-control, self-restraint, contingence. Against such things there is no law that can bring a charge. Now listen, he says that the Holy Spirit who moved on the inside of us brought all these things with him. So when you are tested in something or there's a trial, you're able to bear it because you already have something. And I was like, God, how do, I, how do I explain you already have it? It's like all of us have the same muscles, right? We have muscles in our arms, in our legs. Okay, now, just because I'm not using my muscles does not mean they're not there. But if I need to pick this book up, then I use my muscles. Well, when he's talking about, uh, but let patience have its perfect work, you have patience, now just let it work. Just like you would pick up your book and use your muscles. And so the only thing you're doing when God is saying have faith is now you're going to exercise something you already have. When he talks about having patience, that means you're now just going to exercise something you already have. He said, let it work. Like I have to let my arms work in order to pick this book up. I have to let these muscles work. Now, of course, if I, if I start picking up heavier weights, I'm not going to get any more muscle, am I? Not rhetorical. If I pick up this book, I'm not going to get... I mean, I'm not going to grow another muscle in my arm, right? Because I already have the muscle in my arm already. Yes. Only thing I'm going to do is I'm going to exercise it by picking up the book. Yes. And if I keep increasing the weight on the book, the stronger yes. I can pick up more. Yes. So when you have a test or trial, you need to understand. You're just going to exercise something you already have. Yes. You're not trying to get something. You already have it. And so we keep thinking when we have a test or trial, we got to go get something we don't already have. You already have it. But when you recognize you already have it, then just use it. Just say, you know what? This has happened, but I already have the faith. This is going on. Oh, I got the patience. 
Instead of saying, oh, man, I don't have any patience for this. Oh, my God. Yes, you do. Amen. Are y'all getting what I'm saying? Yes. We got to stop thinking that God has, that we're incomplete. Yes. And that we need to go get something else. We need to look in the word of God and see what we already have and stand on the fact that I already have it. I'm not trying to go get something. I am not missing anything. Oh, I'm just so depressed. You made a decision to be depressed because God says he gave you joy. It's only what, remember when we talked about the mind? It's only what you're thinking that causes you to not believe you don't, that you don't have what you have. It's only what you're seeing with your physical eyes that's causing you to think that you're missing something. God has equipped us with everything that we need to overcome. We just have to start looking in the word of God and start realizing what we have. What do we have? First of all, we have the grace of God, which is the favor of God. I mean, we've read about it. I mean, even before we start talking about grace, really. Favor surrounds us like a shield. Remember every, the example? Everybody was like, ah, favor surrounds me like a shield. And, and goodness and mercy follows me all the days of my life. Oh, that's so good. You go outside and have a flat tire. All of a sudden, you think it ran away? <laughs> but that's, 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 that's what the test is all about, to make you think that you are missing something, you are lacking something, that you don't have the favor of God. That's all. All it's there for is to, to distract you and make you think that it's not there. So you're not even anticipating. You're not even expecting it to happen. You're just expecting from less and less. Get a 20, I split it. I split, I split, what's it? What is it? If I get a 20 and I break it, then it's just going to go away. That's what you're saying. No, if I break it, some more going to come. <laughs> It's what you're thinking. It's what you're seeing. And we all declare, man, you know what? I'm baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm speaking in tongues. Then you got all this stuff that the, that the Holy Spirit brought with him. It didn't seep out. It said that we were sealed. All of it was sealed on the inside of us. Weights, things that easily distract us. He says, I've given you faith. Man, I don't have enough faith for that. Yes, you do. <laughs> if it's faith in you, no, you don't. But if it's faith in what Jesus has done, yes, you do. Y'all getting what I'm saying? We keep trying to get God to produce something he's already produced and given to us. I've given you everything that pertains unto life and godliness. I've given you the ability. I've given, he's, I've given you power. I've given you might. I've given you strength. I'm going to strengthen you in the inner man. Stop trying to do all this self-help stuff. Self-help stuff, trying to fool your mind in the stuff. <laughs> Playing these mind games with yourself. You need to tell self to just be quiet. Just stop it. You need to, you need to start talking to self and building self up. Tell yourself, to, please get out of God's way. Please get out of Jesus' way. Please, you know, you just... I mean, we don't need to do this too much out loud, but you just need to start talking to yourself. You need to tell self where to get off. Just, just self, just. And hear the truth. That's why it's so important that we hear the word. Let's, this is the last scripture, Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. Acts 20, let's look at verse 32, because (laughs) 
I mean, the word tells us that there is no test or trial that comes our way that we're not able to bear it. But we're built up in the word of God, in, in the word of grace concerning all that God has done for us. But in verse 32, this is uh, Paul. He's uh, close to uh, his transitioning. He says, and now, brethren, this is King James, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace. He said, I'm leaving you in the word of his grace. He said, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. He said, it's the word of grace that's going to build you up. It's you understanding what grace is all about. You understanding the favor of God. You understanding it's nothing that you, that you, have, that you have earned. Understanding it's a free gift. Understanding that this is my kind intent. Understanding that this is what I had in mind the whole time. Understanding that, that you're not outside of, of the covenant, but you're inside of, <laughs> think of the Amplified said, or the Message Bible says you're an insider and not an outsider. So the more, listen to me, the more we hear about grace, because Paul says, I'm, 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 I'm going away, but I'm, I'm putting you in good hands. I'm putting you in the hands of grace. I commend you to grace. I commend you to the word of grace. Let's put it that way. So the more we understand grace, the more we understand uh, the favor of God, the more we, we, we uh, uh, embrace it and not try to earn it, the more we will see God produce in our lives, uh, the more we'll see uh, what God, his intentions have been all along. And that we not uh, allow ourselves to get weary in well doings. We do not allow um, the testing, the testing, the trials to move us off of our stance. Because Jesus said, oh, they, they coming, but it's okay. Be of good cheer. I've already overcome it. He says, so... You, you, you work on what's happening in that mind of yours. You work on because that's the only place that the enemy can attack you is in your mind. And he said, you'll have what you say, not what you think. Do you all understand what I'm saying? You'll have what you say, not what you think. And Philemon says in 1 and 6, he said that your faith will begin to work as you begin to acknowledge, admit to, I like that, admit to the word, admit that the word is true. He said, I, I admit it, God, you're right, I have favor. See, y'all think, I'm telling you, he said you need to admit it, you need to, and so again, it's, We need to just read the word. <laughs> we just need to read the word and see what God is saying and just say, it's mine. That's who I am. You're right, God. That is true. I don't have to depend on myself. Oh, Jesus is already taking care of this for me. Yeah, God, you're going to work this out. And just allow him to just, the Holy Spirit to just minister to you and just talk to you. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we just give you praise. We give you honor. We thank you, Lord God, for the power of your word to come to pass in our lives. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for what you have shared with us this night. I thank you, Lord God, that we will put these things in practice, understanding that um, we have everything that Jesus died for us to have. Help us, Lord God, to not be distracted. Help us, Heavenly Father, to recognize readily when the enemy's coming to steal from us. Thank you, Lord God, that we will look into your word and hear what you have to say about the matter. I thank you, Lord God, that we will be steadfast. 
that we'll be unmovable and unchangeable, but that we will be deeply rooted in who you are. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. We pray that today's message was a blessing to you. If you would like to help us further expand the vision, simply text the word Give RTM to the number 41444 or visit us online at www.revealingtruth.org. Now remember, Jesus loves you.